on to you, Matt. Great. Thanks. The the main thing I want to convey today is that reinforcement learning is a mature technology that you really should know something about. Because if it can apply to your problem, it can be a game changer. So there's a few things I want to cover. Mainly, there's there's kind of three topics. First of all, why why are we doing this now? And that's just to kind of level set us all. Then we'll go into some background. And if you've already been familiar with, uh, if you've already done some Coursera work, if you're already familiar with reinforcement learning, hopefully this will reinforce some of those. Um, but I'll also provide some some novel information. And then finally, we'll go through some examples of reinforcement learning and where it might or might not be useful. Now, I, I really would like to keep this interactive. I, I am a professor. I can listen to myself talk for hours, um, but it is much more fun if you interrupt. So it, I've got the uh, Zoom chat open. You please unmute, uh, turn on your uh, camera. Any of that would be awesome because the, the whole point of this is to try to give you the information and material you want. So if you have questions, if you have comments, if you want me to elaborate on something, please do speak up. So you, you are welcome to uh, interrupt me at any time, and we will also have some time at the end. So with that, I guess I'll dive in. And first, so probably most of you already know the AI, the term AI was coined in the 50s. And we think about AI as being something that needs some kind of cognitive ability. And, and what this means changes over time. And in some sense, it's kind of a moving target. So a few years ago, reinforcement learning was used to beat a world champion at Go. And this was this huge breakthrough. And just an hour ago, I was sitting in a talk where the person was like, well, sure, we've done Go before, but that's not really a hard problem. Like, are you kidding me? Go is incredibly hard. So the, the bars for what is good AI all, is always moving. The goalposts are always moving. But when we think about AI right now, we're mostly talking about machine learning. It's one of the approaches to AI. And it became popular in the 80s. And right now, we're often using deep artificial neural networks. But you can do machine learning without neural nets. And you can certainly do AI without machine learning. Now, this is probably preaching to the choir, but oops, this is the AI index of 2021. So this just came out, and this is from the, the Stanford um, group, and this is pretty interesting. It's, it's pretty dense, but I wanted to pull out a few points. So the first one was that if we look at publications worldwide, AI is becoming increasingly popular. That this is not just true in North America, but around the world, particularly in China. There's been a huge uptick in the amount of interest in AI. And this last year, even though we're in this huge COVID-related recession, about half of these companies surveyed were still um, investing in AI. And about a quarter were increasing AI investment. And for those Canadians out there, hopefully you already know that we were the first country to have a national AI strategy. And since then, over 30 other um, groups have kind of jumped on the bandwagon. So one of the reasons I really enjoy talking with you is trying to get this awesome technology out of the lab and into the hands of people who can use it. Because I really do believe, so AI is the new electricity. This was Andrew Ng saying how, Every company is going to need someone to handle AI, because even if you are not using it right now, you need to be aware of what's coming. And since I live in Alberta, it's also the new oil, possibly with fewer dead dinosaurs. Um, okay, so so why now? So we've been we've been talking about AI for decades, and there's a few things that are kind of coming together to make this an incredibly important time to look at AI. So the first one is just, we've got better compute, right? So my, my iPhone has more than the amount of compute that NASA used when they put a man on the moon, right? So because we're getting more and more compute, we can just do more. It helps that our algorithms are better though, because you know if something is uh, N cubed, more compute's only gonna help to a certain amount. 
But one of the things that I think aggregate intellect is helping a lot with is figuring out how to get AI really into the hands of businesses, away from just nerds like me, and also trying to get more available talent. So right now, if you've tried to hire an AI, you've probably found it pretty difficult because there just aren't a ton of people out there with this skill set. So it's important that we we try to help upskill people who don't necessarily have a PhD in machine learning. But then with the right tools, we can think about how do I automate processes? How do I get them better? How do I produce results um, more quickly, better results, lower cost? And the one I'm really interested in is how could we identify new business processes? How can we identify new opportunities that I can't do without machine learning? So that's pretty exciting. So one, one of those you could think of being, um, uh, uh, sorry, lost it. One of those things you could think of is being a, re- a recommender system. It's really hard. So when you go into the bookstore, you could go and see you know, different people's, Alex's recommendations are here. But it's only when you start shopping online, when you get a bunch of data about you, when they can say, hey, Matt, here's this new sci-fi book. You should go check it out. We think you'll like it. So, okay, last slide of the background, three types of machine learning. There's supervised learning, where we're trying to figure out, is is the stock going to go up or go down? So I have some input, I make a prediction, and then I'm told, well, you guessed Y. Actually, the result was Y prime. And that could be a label or it could be a number. There's also the unsupervised learning. So spot the credit card fraud. And then there's reinforcement learning, which we'll be talking about today. Okay, so now we've got some a bit more context. No one's interested, which either means you're bored or it's been perfectly clear. I'm going to go with a second one, but I'm going to take a dramatic drink of water here in case someone wants to hop in with a question. Okay, cool. So now let's get into what what this this, uh, tool that I've been working on since 2003 actually involves. So one of the challenges of reinforcement learning is it's agent focused. So I've got an agent, which is a thing, it could be physical or virtual, and it's trying to interact with some environment. So the agent is in a state, takes an action, and then gets a reward. So think about supervised learning, right? This is you can think of supervised learning as a prediction machine. You, you give me the right input and I'll give you a good output. So if you could give me enough information about a customer, I could figure out what to ship to that customer so that they receive it before they know it. That's kind of cool. It's answering a question. And here, our agent isn't really answering a question. It's trying to do something over time. So it's trying to maximize this reward. So for instance, if I'm doing a commuting task, I'm trying to get to work as fast as possible. Well, then my reward would be based on how quickly I got to work. Well, maybe it's not just time. Maybe I also cared about my fuel efficiency, or maybe I cared about my safety. So maybe I I probably don't want to run into too many things on my way to work. So you could think of all of these different things, all of these different objectives, and kind of squish them together into some kind of reward signal. But when I go, when I take um, uh, uh, take the the Valley Road to get to work, um, I'm not told that was the right decision or that was the wrong decision. Instead, I just choose something. I interact with the world. I make a decision or set of decisions, and then eventually I've told, okay, here's how long it took you to get to work. And typically. I'm assuming with this commuting example, I'm assuming we don't have Google Maps. So I can't just ask Google, which way should I go? Instead, I need to try out a few things and figure out which is the fastest way to work. Well, maybe it depends on the time of day, or maybe it depends on the weather, or maybe a new road opens up. And I have no idea if this new road is good, but I need to try it to find out. But if I just act completely randomly, I am never going to get to work on time. And I'm never going to find out a lot about what is probably the best thing to do. 
So with some probability, some of the time, I do want to exploit my knowledge. So this exploration versus exploitation is one of the key trade-offs in reinforcement learning. And this is really one of the differences um, between reinforcement learning and other kinds of machine learning, where you really need to think about actively gathering more information versus using that information to do what you actually want to do. So let's make this a little more concrete. One of the things I often hear, well, this is less true. Five years ago, many people would say, reinforcement learning is great for games. It's not very useful, is it? It's like, well, I, I got into reinforcement learning because it was good for games, and that's fun. And so I already mentioned AlphaGo. There's also been this work with Dota, and OpenAI beat a team of world-class Dota champions. Okay, cool. But it can also be used for many more practical things. So there's a number of companies, including in Canada, that are working on robotics. One of the hot topics there is pick and place. So if you've got an automated warehouse, you want to automate the entire pipeline, you need a robot that can pick things out of a bin and put pack it into a new uh, cardboard box. There's data center cooling. How do I change the, the speed of computers over time to reduce my energy usage? There's pricing options, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And there's also some work that I was lucky to do when I was working with Borealis AI, which is um, affiliated with Royal Bank of Canada. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. But in all of all six of these, you make actions over time, you select actions over time, and you're trying to optimize something so that maybe that's your, your chance of winning or your points in the game. And what you did in the past is going to affect what you do in the future. And no one ever comes in and tells you, oh, you, you picked up that box in the wrong way. Here's how you should have done it. You don't have that ground truth. You just have to mess around and figure out what works. So I, I bring all these up as examples of where machine learning applies. And some of them are more or less obvious. So if you think video games, that fits kind of naturally reinforcement learning, robotics, okay. But pricing options, not as much. So my, my pitch is that it's worth, if you're interested in machine learning or even data science in general, knowing about where reinforcement learning could apply will help you recognize if you, we've got this really powerful reinforcement learning hammer, let's, if you've got a nail, that this hammer could be used for, then this could be exactly the right solution. There's a number, when, when you talk about supervised learning, you often think about what's my accuracy and maybe what's my accuracy on a held out test set. Reinforcement learning actually has a bunch of different goals. So I, I said, we've got this real valued reward signal. So maybe it's a score in a game and you want to maximize it. But what does that mean? Well, so one thing you could mean is I want to maximize my final performance. I, I just want to beat the world champion at Go. Or maybe if you're, say, in a stock market setting, maybe you really don't want to go bankrupt before your agent learns to perform well. That would be nice. Or if you're in ro a robot setting, I really don't want my robot to explode. So we need to worry about safety. Ideally, you'd get something, you choose algorithms that help you learn quickly and get to a final, good final performance. Now, other things you might care about is the, the poor nerd like me sitting there trying to get the robot working. You know, can we reduce that programmer's time and effort? Can we reduce the amount of background that that programmer needs in order to successfully deploy reinforcement learning? Another cool thing that RL can often do is come up with unanticipated solutions. So if I know how to play a perfect game of Go, then an agent could just try to replicate me, but I don't. I'm actually really bad at Go. So instead, I want our agents to come up with things that I haven't thought of. And this is particularly important if there are changes to the environment. So like I mentioned with the commuting example, a new road could open up or 
suddenly it's my it's not my first winter, but suppose it was my first winter in Edmonton and you get that first hard snow, how you drive. Maybe you haven't seen that before. Or maybe you haven't seen that before with the car you have now, which you really should replace its tires because it's starting to skid. So these are all kind of the, the benefits of reinforcement learning, that it can handle all of these different settings. Now, the next, I'm going to drill down into one particular toy domain before we go into some more realistic things. So now I'm going to take question. another sip of water. Oh, perfect. Please go ahead. Like the, on the diagram, right? Um, to know you are going on the red path first, you, you will have to know there's a black path that is lower. Like, how do you know if you are just solving a problem? Uh, like, which which one to go with, right? Because you won't know the actual graph, right? That's completely right. So if we, um, Jesse was earlier talking about the contextual bandit. So there's this, there's this idea of a multi-arm bandit. So you go down to Las Vegas and there's a few arms you could pull on a slot machine. And let's say you start pulling arm on slot machine one. And over time, it seems to be paying out about $2 per hour. Now, as a, as a person, I know that's actually pretty good because slot machines are made to suck money out of us. So getting any kind of positive return is pretty awesome. But it could be that the slot machine next to you would have given you $100 per hour. And you really don't know that until you start messing around. So go, or going back to the commuting example, it could be that I am super excited by finding a 25-minute commute to work. But maybe if I just tried a bit harder, I could have found an 18 minute commute. Does that address your problem or did I miss, did I misinterpret it? No, no, I think, I think you addressed the problem. So you, you, that means at the beginning you do some exploration on different uh, possible methods first. Exactly. Sort of, okay. All right. Thank you. And this is, this is one of the challenges because let's say you have a robot that is exploring a room in reinforcement learning in general you assume there is always some small possibility that if the robot runs into the wall, it gets a pot of gold. So it bangs its head against the wall, nothing happens. So maybe it learns not to do that. What happens if I bang my head twice? What happens if I bang my head twice, turn around and then bang my head on a different wall? Now these are increasingly unlikely to pay off, but it could if you don't have constraints on what, the, what is possible in the environment. So just like if I'm trying to minimize my time, maybe there's a commuting path that takes zero time. Now, we know that's not possible, but the agent doesn't. So figuring out how to inject um, human knowledge into the agent can be very important. Any other questions while we're here? Uh, hello, this is Elham Soleimani. Uh, I've uh, taken a reinforcement course with the uh, University of Alberta, and that was really interesting. So uh, right now I'm uh, working on um, uh, real world uh, projects and uh, something that could be a reinforcement uh, learning problem. Uh, one question that I have is that uh, the first steps of the uh, RL to learn is to really do some trial and errors and uh, try to learn from the environment, right? Yep, that's right. Yeah. Okay, uh, I wasn't sure if you heard me. Oh. So um, my question is, uh, is, it, is there any way to reduce that time by using some recorded data, some kind of recorded experiments? Uh, I've heard something about, uh, for example, for Atari games, uh, one technique that they use is that they record the videos of uh, playing games with uh, by humans and try to explore, uh, like use that for uh, this time. Uh, so um, I'd like to know if uh, that's, that applies to uh, most cases or not. So that's, that's actually exactly the sub area that my research focuses on. And that could, that yeah. could easily be another hour and a half talk. But the, the, <laughs> short, the short answer is if, if another agent or another program or a person have information, you can absolutely incorporate incorporate that into your agent. So instead, let's see if I can show this. So instead of doing something like this, 
hopefully you can start higher. So you avoid a lot of that initial exploration. Hopefully you end up at a better performance and you do it much faster. So um, if you search for interactive reinforcement learning or human mm -hmm. in the loop, you can learn from, hu so let's just thinking about humans, you could learn from human demonstrations. There's been work looking at people playing Atari games on YouTube, learning from that. You could have, we know that humans can train dogs. You can also have humans train robots. So good robot, bad robot. That helps you speed up learning. And you could use similar uh, concepts from an agent, another agent or a program. So if you have an existing PID controller that's controlling something and you want RL to take over from it and improve on that, you could absolutely do that. So depending on what setting you're in, this could be a real game changer. So one example is uh, we went training one particular task. We went from, I think it was 18 hours to 10 hours. So cut the time almost in half with three minutes of human demonstration. Mm -hmm. okay. So if, if, you, if you can get around learning from scratch, that can be a huge benefit. Yes, uh, that's actually one of the main challenges that we are facing with our project. Uh, it, it's an industrial project, so it's uh, the time uh, costs for the customer. So, um, yes, thank you for the keyword. Uh, I will definitely look into the, your uh, publications and your research work. Uh, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Oh, and this is a, a good time. Um, I, I'm, we're we're talking again next week, but in general, if 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 this is interesting, I'm happy to continue the discussion over email as well. So if hey hey Matt, you mentioned this this keyword or something about speeding up reinforce, just shoot me an email, and I'll be happy to happy to send you send you some papers. Sure, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Welcome. I have a quick question. Can yeah, I throw please. it in, or is it okay? Yeah, please. Yeah, I had put it in the chat. It's just really. Um, you know, NASA have hit Mars now, and um, I was just wondering about, um, they don't, they have to be very careful about how much equipment they actually send. They don't have unlimited supplies. Um, can you talk a little bit about how they might have used reinforcement learning, but also to reduce the risk of losing the probes and the things when they're trying to learn on the surface? Could you say anything about that? Yeah. So what one of the typical examples of reinforcement learning is saying, hey, let's say we're up on the moon or on Mars and we lose a wheel or one of our wheels doesn't work as well. We want to be able to robustly handle that. Excuse me. So that's one way RL could be useful. Another way is right now on Mars, the Mars rover is out of contact for most of the day and can only come in contact for a little bit. So if RL can help the rover try a few things, explore a through few things. And then during that 15 minute window, the humans can say, okay, you found out about these four things, go find out more about number three. So it could absolutely be useful for that either fully autonomous or semi-autonomous situation. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Also, um, uh, Putra mentioned the work from Chelsea Finn looking at weekly supervised RL, and she's also done a ton of cool stuff on meta learning. So thinking about how do I learn a bunch of different tasks or how do I learn to learn? Okay, so now let's go into a really simple example. Here's Wally. Wally is trying to get out of this horrible, horrible maze and could either get the plus one or the minus one. So this is how we define a Markov decision process. And it's composed, composed of about uh, four things. So there's the states. Where could this robot be? There's the actions. What are the, where could it go? Okay, let's just say up, down, left, right. There's the transition function. So Wally isn't allowed to go through walls. And if Wally tries to go up, there's a small chance he would slip to the side or slip to the side. And if he slipped to the left, he would just stay where he is. If he slipped to the right, he would go to the right. The reward function, what is Wally trying to do? This is not such a hard task. He's just trying to get to the plus one and avoid the minus one. And there's a small step penalty to reduce the amount of time that it takes to get there. 
the whole goal of reinforcement learning is typically, how do I learn a policy? How do I figure out how to act? So let's take a step back and say, in reinforcement learning, I've talked about you have to interact with the environment. You have to think, you have to drive somewhere and measure the time. If you had Google Maps, maybe you knew everything. Maybe you know the traffic. Maybe you know the weather conditions, and you can just plan. So in some cases, if you know the entire reward, if you know the entire transition function, you don't need to interact with the environment. You might just be able to think about it. Um, great question. If you want to learn more about RL, if you want to mess around with it, I would really recommend OpenAI Gen. And they also have some good tutorials on spinning up. So when, if you think RL could be useful for you, I would start with OpenAI Open Gym. And at the end of this, I'll, I'll end with a bunch of, of resources that you could do, use to learn more. Yeah, you're welcome. So, so thinking, let's, let's say I, I was just able to write everything down and I could just think, what's, what's the right thing for Wally to do? Well, if there's a, this step penalty, well, this, this seems pretty straightforward. Wally just does the right, correct thing. Here and here, Wally's trying to make sure that, well, if he goes up here, there's a small chance he might go to the right and get that negative one. So if Wally found himself down here in the lower left, or excuse me, lower right, the thing he'd probably want to do is just go all the way around. Okay. 12-state problem. Not so bad. Solve this in a very small fraction of a second. Why am I bothering with this? Well, the one, one of the challenges with RL is really defining that reward function. So let's say the step penalty is smaller. Now, in this state, to the right of the wall, the agent's optimal action is to go left. If it goes up, there's a small chance it would get into negative one. Instead, if it goes left, it's just going to keep running into that wall until there's a small chance it slips down or slips up. Similar argument over here in the lower right. Now let's turn the step penalty up higher. Now the agent just wants it all to end. It's like a very sad grad student. Um, the, now every step, every action is a negative two. So he just wants the pain to stop. Yeah. Um, it, I loved grad school. There were definitely hard times. Um, so changing the reward function, even in small ways, can have big differences on what your agent learns. And the agent is going to learn to maximize that reward, whether it's legal, whether it's ethical, whether it's what you want it to do. So in some cases, if you are playing Go, this is easy to specify. If you are talking about commuting to work, how do you balance off time with fuel efficiency with safety? That might not be trivial. Okay, now, now we've got a shared background and now we can get into some examples. And the goal of this will hopefully be, well, there's a few goals. One is to try to give you a feeling for where RL might be applied because one of the biggest challenges is identifying RL problems because it is a very different way than thinking about supervised learning. But then if you find an RL problem, how you could start setting that up and how you could start tackling it. Okay. So now we just had a toy problem, and now we're going to go to one of the more important domains, Flappy Bird. Okay, maybe this is not one of the most important ones, but I thought it was a nice example. So if you haven't seen Flappy Bird, you, you're missing out. Oh, man, this was – so when, when was this? It was like, I want to say 2013. It was, it was a thing, man. So what, what is this? We've got this bird, and the bird's flying around. So every time the bird hits the ground or hits the pipe, you start over. And, oh, good question. Um, so, uh, Robert, come back to that in a sec. Um, so here, the bird is just trying to get past those pipes, and it can't. This is reinforcement learning. This is what Elham was talking about. At the beginning of reinforcement learning, it's real bad. It has no idea what's going on. Okay, so let's let's skip forward to... 
30 minutes in or so. Hey, now, now Flappy is not hitting all the pipes. That's pretty cool. Okay, so let's go to uh, two and a half hours. And now we've got superhuman performance. So the reason I like this, this example, is you can say, okay, here's my problem. This was not a reinforcement learning problem. The grid world I showed you was something that was set up to show how RL works. This was an existing game that was making money. And we said, okay, now how could I learn a policy for Flappy Bird? Well, the transition function is just controlled by the game, right? The, the video game is going to tell us what happens. Does anyone know or remember what the action for Flappy Bird is? Move up or down. Close. <laughs> up, up. Yep. So the only thing you could do, there's a few games like this. The only thing you can do is press the screen. And when you press the screen, you flap. That's that's a bird. Yeah, he's flapping. Um, so press the screen and you flap. Then the reward, what would be a reasonable reward for this? Um, hey, number you pass? Points. Yep, any others? Levels. Levels, yeah. So you could have the number of pipes you pass, whatever this number is up here, the score. You could also have the distance. You could also have the time you've gone without dying. All of these in this game are equivalent, so it doesn't really matter. But then how do I represent state? So if I, if I wanted to use deep reinforcement learning, I could say, I want to reason over these pixels. Instead of reasoning over pixels, I could just think about the distance to a pipe and a height from the top of the pipe. And knowing those two numbers is sufficient to let the bird act optimally. So this is an example where you want to give the bird enough information, the agent enough information, so it's uh, necessary and sufficient. There's no reason to tell it what color the sky is. It doesn't matter how um, how high it is from the top of the the top of the uh, game. It doesn't matter what color the bird is. All of that's irrelevant. So in this case, you want to give your agent just as much as it needs and not more, because the more it has, the more it has to think about, and the harder it is to learn. Is there so, a speed here? Sorry. Sorry, go ahead. A, a speed a parameter here? No, because the bird always goes at exactly the same speed. I see. Good thinking. Um, so you can absolutely use an AI system to control a hot water loop. So that's that's a control problem. You can think about a chemical plant or a boiler. RL can work there. Um, RL is absolutely being used for sustainability. So I'll get into one example in a few slides, but uh, another example is thinking about um, energy. So thinking about optimizing HVAC systems and training the time of RL algorithms. That's right. So Flappy Bird went for two and a half out two and a half hours, and one thing you could do is just use uh, distributed computing. So if we have a simulator, let's take a hundred copies of Flappy Bird and have those 100 agents trained at once. That's a simple way of doing it. But time can be a really critical thing. So if you can solve an RL problem, great. If you can't solve it fast enough for it to be useful, that's where you try to bring in the more complex algorithms or figure out other ways of speeding up learning. OK, so had a second toy exam. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah I, there's a lot that can be done in smart homes. Um, I worked with a, a smart home expert, and one of the things that's interesting is cats just kind of teleport. So if, if you have sensors that spot motion, you see people walking around the house, cats just teleport. They show up different places. Cats are awesome. Um, so second, second example. This is also very simple, but is actually a real world option, or excuse me, real world problem. So if you have an option, 
that uh, it's a call or a put that says you can buy or sell an asset at a certain price. So for instance, I could say, I want to be able to buy Google at its current price of 100 in the next 30 days. If the price of Google goes down to 90, I just let it go, don't do anything. If the price of Google goes up to 110, I can execute that option and make $10. But the question is, when do I exercise that option? If I know when to exercise it, then I can accurately price it. So this is an example of a stopping problem. I can keep things going until at some point I say, enough, pull the trigger, or I run out of time. So we can define state in Flappy Bird. We saw it was just the X and Y position. Here, it's the price and the time left until I run out of time. The action is just binary. Do I exercise or not? And then the reward I get is basically what I just said. So the reward of exercising the option when you bought it 100 and now it's up to 110, now the reward is 10. Or if it goes down to 90, the reward would be zero. And we don't control the transition function. We're not just Flappy Bird anymore. Now we've got a real stock market. And this could be simulated data. You could be doing back testing, or maybe it's live. But in both cases, this is a this is a case where if you decide not to execute, or excuse me, not to exercise that option, that's going to affect what happens in the future. I so this a is a relative. Sure, go ahead. Why the reward has to be positive? Oh, it does not. Okay, so in this case, if it's if it goes down to uh, point nine or ninety, it should be negative. No. Well, right. So with the, with the option, it just gives us uh, the option to exercise. So if it goes down to 90, I'm going to say I will not exercise that option. So the option costs some amount to, to purchase. So that's going to be a sunk cost. And then you would execute the option if it's going to help you. If it's not going to help you, then you won't execute it and it will just expire. Okay. But but in, gen in general, you're right that I say reward. But I could also be saying, instead of maximizing reward, I might want to minimize cost. And those are, those are equivalent. Okay. Okay. Now, example number three, we're going to take a step again in finance, but now a very large jump in complexity. So I mentioned Aiden from uh, RBC and Borealis AI. and. Here, the state is, well, first, let me say what the problem is. So let's say you've got $5 million of Google and you want to sell it. If you just try to sell everything right now, you're going to be in trouble because the price is going to plummet. So instead, you need to figure out how to partition out those shares throughout the day. And Putra is exactly right that it's, it's basically the, the strike price minus the price for the reward um, in the option setting. And here, it's it's more complicated because now we're saying, I, I know I need to sell these shares, but I need to kind of do it throughout the day to kind of try to hide it so that other people don't exploit me. So there's going to be some information about the current stock and what's going on in the market. And before, with the, with the option, I could either exercise now or not. Here, I could not sell anything. I could sell a little or I could sell a lot at each time step. And then the rewards, and at, at a high level, the reward is just how much money do I make? Um, in this case, the idea is that you try to sell, in this case, in a way that kind of hides it based on what the volume of the market is doing. So if you're able to successfully hide your, your stock movement, then you win. And that, that's correlated with um, getting the most money for without losing the most. And then again, it's just the stock market. So when you're, when you're doing this, you may or may not be um, acting with a real world or it could be in a simulator. But when you're in the real world, these actions, this exploration could be costing you real money. 
So, okay, so we've got our stock market here, the environment. And what are we going to do? Well, I've got my policy that's telling me how to act. So this is either don't buy, don't sell, sell a little or sell a lot. Then I place my order, something happens, and that gives me new state information and I get my reward. Now, one thing we haven't talked at all about is what they called self-aware features, which you can also think of as memory. So instead of just thinking about what I see now, think about what I saw in the past. Um, so hopping into the chat, you can absolutely use uh, supervised learning in some time series predictions. One of the questions is whether it's really a one-shot decision or decision over time. And that, that, can, that can mean supervised learning may or may not be really applicable. And, oh, good. Next, uh, uh, yep, go ahead. Yeah, hi, my name is David. I, um, I'm working in this area with finance. My, most of my career has been as a hotelier, but for the last several years, I've been working on a startup with algorithmic trading. And I'm, you know, I've, I've done a fair amount of work with regression analysis and classification using more or less traditional neural networks. And my, the big question in my mind about reinforcement learning has been, uh, one of them has been, in this situation, you, know, you have something here called market features. And you know, with with both the uh, both of the two examples you gave, figuring out the volatility of the market is obviously important to both those tasks. And there's all sorts of uh, data in the market reflecting volatility. There's um, you know formulas that can purportedly calculate volatility. How how, how do you balance with reinforcement learning? How much uh, you know what we'd call in the neural network setting uh, feature identification? Do you want to do, and how much do you want to let the um, the algorithm just explore the data on its own? Yeah, that's that's the million dollar question. Um, the the short answer is Aiden uses many many features, and most of them I was never told about because that's exactly the trade secret. Mm -hmm. So a, as a researcher actively working on this, that those those were kept behind the curtain, and you can spend and and that's a great question because you could spend years trying to figure out the right features. And how do you trade that off with figuring out what I have right now is good enough? And then, and then I guess the follow, the follow up question on that is that, you know, let's say you, you do feed it some features. How, how do you balance um, how much exploration it does versus refinement of, uh, you know, a path that it's already set out on? Yeah. And that, that goes back to the exploration versus exploitation trade off. So there, there are ways to do that systematically. And there are ways to think about how that, uh, how your risk impacts that. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay. So like I said, I enjoy talking. Apparently I talked a little too much. Um, so I'm going to hop over the last example just to, but I will point out the nice thing about water treatment is you can think about having environmental benefits and fiscal benefits. So that's pretty cool. So that's that's an example of where uh, machine learning and reinforcement learning can be used to, to uh, not just make you money, but actually save the planet too. So, okay, so wrapping up, agents can solve hard tasks. Maybe the programmer doesn't have to specify so much. Maybe Hopefully it's less work and we can outperform humans and we can handle changes in the environment. Great. Everyone should use RL for everything. Well, that's not entirely true, because I mentioned before that you know it it it's going to do whatever the reward tells it to. And when you're interacting with the world, it can have a real cost. So your robots wearing down, you're losing money on the stock market. You have an opportunity cost. So I mentioned Dota. What I didn't mention is the company used 180 years of gameplay data every day. They use an absurd amount of compute, lots and lots of distributed compute so that they could learn quickly. And that's going to be out of the out of uh, scope for most, most of us. Another active area is explainability. How do you tell your boss, please use this agent? No, I don't, I don't really understand how it works. Just trust me. And like we mentioned a few times, the initial performance could be poor. So wrapping up. If I have a sequential decision task where it's not just a short-term decision, it's got these longer-term effects, 
and I don't know everything, I have to interact with the world, RL can be a great solution. It's even better if when you explore and do something dumb, it doesn't kill you. Hopefully there's not that's not too catastrophic. You want to think about how much you could can improve over state of the art. So if you're going to get a 1% versus 200% improvement, those are very different amounts of uh, time you'd be willing to invest. Also, AI is cool. If you could say you've got an RL controller helping your water, water filtration plant, that, that can be worth something. Um, think about how hard is it to get the data, where the action, uh, how to execute actions, and maybe there's an abstract version. So maybe I could sol solve a toy version of the problem. So I believe these slides will be available, but if you are interested, there's here are four things related to reinforcement learning. Uh, particularly, there's a Coursera class, a Udacity class, and two books that I can recommend. If you want to just jump directly into deep reinforcement learning, I can recommend these two. In particular, the OpenAI, lots of people look at. Thank you for that, Amir. Um, and then I will also mention, we, we just signed a contract for a book where we're trying to say, Reinforcement learning needs to be get in the hands of practitioners, not people who have PhDs. So what can we do to make that happen? So this is one of the reasons I like talk, talking with you, people like you, because I can find out more about what real world problems look like, not video games. Okay, so with that, I'll take a break here. I, went, I talked a little bit longer than I meant to, but if you have time, I'm able to, to stick around a bit later than we're scheduled to end. Thank you so much, Matt. Uh, very engaging uh, talk and discussion as usual. So folks, you have a few minutes. Uh, please do unmute yourself and ask questions. Thank you for the questions while we were going. I do appreciate that. That was much more interesting than me just talking at you. Uh, I think we did we miss one question was asking about what your preferred environment to do RL is? Yeah, so for the if that was, was that the one, how do I learn about RL or how do I start doing that? Um, so if you want to think about a uh, library for RL environments that I would suggest go with the open AI, open AI gym framework. Definitely. Okay. Any more questions? Uh, you know, the other thing I've been wondering um, about general machine learning concepts and how that, how they translate to machine uh, to, um, reinforcement learning is, is regularization. So let's say you have a scenario where for whatever reason, you're limited to playing your um, scenario out of your game, let's say 1500 times instead of a million times. And you know, with, a, with a relatively small number like that, if you were using a neural network, you could probably figure out all sorts of great solutions. But when you took them outside of that 1500 iteration set, you would have found you had curve fitted to your data and it wasn't such a great solution. In, in the reinforcement learning environment, are you, um, wh what are the ways that you go about handling um, curve fitting? Yeah, that's a great question. So if, you, if you're if you limited to 1500 times, you, you need to think a lot about that bias variance trade-off that you get in normal machine learning. So if I give you a deep neural network with a hundred uh, state features, you're no, you're just not going to learn anything with that amount of data. But if I give you a small tabular representation with a carefully chosen state representation, you could absolutely learn something with a reasonable chance of generalizing. But but it, it really is figuring out how you can generalize, how you can inject that prior knowledge. And after that 1500, do you have to turn off learning? Because some cases you could deploy the model, but then continue learning on the back end and realize, oh, now that I've gotten another 3,000, I can update that model. And, and part of it is, if, if you really only have 1,500, you, you got to do the best you can. And if, if reinforcement learning is the right answer, you probably won't be able to get away with supervised learning or optimization. Hey, Matt, I have a question. Um, I wonder if we can if we can give us some tips about defining um, 
what are your tips for defining a reward function? Um, I, I will just tell you my experience. I recently participated, I guess it was last year, on the AWS um, racer, racer track competition. And I guess my biggest mistake, it was that I was trying to put too much rules on my um, reward function instead of trying to make it general. And um, I, I, I think that was my failure. I don't know, what's, what's your take on that? Yeah, and, and rewards are one of the things that reinforcement learning academics have typically ignored. Because in, in academia, we usually assume someone hands you an MDP and you maximize that reward. In the real world, you need to figure out what you're maximizing. So this, it, one thing you could do is just try to minimize your time. Well, that's kind of hard to do. Well, or, or you could just say you get a one if you win the race or zero otherwise. That's going to be a very sparse reward and hard to learn. You could minimize your time. That might help you. That, that's a little more dense. You could do something like your distance over time. So figuring out how fast am I progressing? And maybe that's something that could help you learn faster because you could get, you could get this information on every time step. But you're right. There's the more information you put into the reward function, the more you're constraining the agent and imposing on it what you think is the right thing to do. So to put it another way, uh, I wanted to get back to this. Alice was mentioning that, that she was doing stuff in healthcare. And one of the ways RL can fit into healthcare is thinking about treatment regimes. So thinking about, I'm going to administer drug A, see what happens, and then administer drug B or C. And there you could think about, I get a one if the patient survives or a zero if they die. Or you could do something more nuanced. So you could think about how well are they responding to this treatment? How well are they feeling? How, how are they doing 100 days after the treatment? And all of this could potentially go into the reward function, but there's really not an obvious answer. It really is going to be domain dependent. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, I think Putra had a question. Uh, right. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the, for the talk, Matt. Um, curious about the uh, the action space of Aiden. I think you had like this diagram, which had the action space of Aiden. It goes into the limit order, right? That that's like how limit order is generated. Um, there's a lot of like uh, there are a lot of details behind the limit order. So I'm curious how an what's in that action space that helps like uh, one to build that limit order. Like uh, there's like some continuous stuff to fill in in limit order. There's some discrete stuff to fill in. Um, or maybe that's Absolutely. trade secret. So, uh, yeah. Thanks. Um, so the the quick answer is you could you could think of if if I decide I want to sell a little or a lot based on the current order book, I could try to choose a price that kind of makes sense. Um, but you're right. You could so so you could have some hand coded rules to help the agent pick between three things and then you just make it work. Or you could have the agent pick between a hundred different things. So maybe the amount of stock and then the strike and then the price, or do I, do I just put one order? Do I want to want to put in three orders at different magnitudes, different sizes and different prices. And that's another example where you could help the agent by constraining it and potentially limiting its performance or you can give it more options, more opportunity to learn better, but possibly at the cost of slower learning speeds. So that's a trade-off you'll often see. Does that does that answer or at least help? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So basically, um, there's some like financial domain expert knowledge that's uh, that's also used to design this uh, action space. And in general, it, if you've got domain knowledge, it would probably be silly to exclude it. Yeah. And if if you search for Aiden, um, Borealis does have a nice blog article on it that goes into, um, I think they have almost all of the public details there. So if you're interested in that particular application, I'd recommend that. Cool, thanks. And there is a question in the chat about Mu0. And one of the things about Mu0 is it's learning a model of the environment. So you can you can think of there's there's at least two ways to do reinforcement learning one what i've described is you just kind of learn a policy and figure out how to act another would be let me figure out 
a model of the environment and then use planning to solve that model. So for instance, if I have a robotic arm, if I knew that robot arm perfectly, I could use inverse kinematics to control it, done. If I have a robot arm and I don't know exactly how it works, maybe I could learn a model that's not perfect, but it's close enough. And I could learn that model and then plan over that model. So I can combine learning online with kind of dreaming about what I would do in the world if this were the, if this were the real world and kind of combining those two. And that was one of the really cool things about MuZero is really updating those model learning methods. Um, the water treatment is not yet uh, public. It's, rel it's relatively recent, but if you search for Amy and water treatment, there is a nice um, write-up on that. The, the, short, the short answer is we're not working on the full plant. Instead, we're working on a bench model. And this is a big bench. This is a million dollar model. And right now they're working on optimizing that bench model and then can deploy it on the real plant. Ooh, yeah. So reinforcement learning is a tool and this tool can be used to solve a problem completely, which is what I've been talking about. It could also be used as a component of something else. So for instance, if you are doing um, deep supervised learning, there's a bunch of hyperparameters to tune. Reinforcement learning can help you tune those parameters. Or if you've got this big complex system and there's one part that you can't figure out a good way to control, well, may maybe a, a simple controller like a PID doesn't work. Maybe I can use reinforcement learning for just that one part of this overall system. So RL can absolutely be used as just one part of a solution, not the entire thing. Um, uh, I think uh, you were answering to my question. Um, so I was trying what... to, yes. <laughs> uh, so what about uh, the other way around? Around. So is it uh, is it possible to use uh, some supervised, unsupervised uh, sub-problem tricks to speed up the uh, general reinforcement learning problem? Do you have any experience with that? Absolutely. So one, one of the ways this comes up in particular is thinking about the features. How am I going to describe the state? And if I can do some clustering and figure out, oh, actually these five features are all correlated mm -hmm. and looking at all five of them doesn't help me. Let me get rid of four of them, make it easier for the agent to learn and we're not throwing out critical information. So that, that's a simple way of, of thinking about how just data analysis uh, could and unsupervised learning could help you. For supervised learning, I'm sure there's ways that it could also help you, but I'm blank. Oh, well, in, in reinforcement learning, you often have a function approximator like a deep neural network. And then how you train that deep neural network is exactly using supervised learning. So when, when um, uh, Jimmy Baugh came out with the Atom Optimizer, that was a huge improvement for supervised learning and reinforcement learning people just grabbed that thing from supervised learning and put it inside of our, our algorithms because we have a, a, a long and storied history of stealing everything we can from supervised learning to make reinforcement learning a little bit better. Wonderful, thank you. You're welcome. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. I'm going to jump in. And I know you have a lot more questions, but as Matt uh, offered, please do email him uh, if you have questions. But also, you know, hopefully you come back next week and have more questions. If you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, please ping me and we can send you the information. My, I'll put my email in the chat if you have any questions. But uh, uh, there will be a second half to this talk and, and you can come back next week to hear about that. Matt, do you want to say like a couple of sentences about the topic for next week? You don't want to just keep it a big surprise? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <Did that>? <laughs> <laughs> no. So so next week, I can't remember the actual title. Um, but basically, we're going to be talking about, um, well, no. I want to look up the right title to make sure I say it correctly. 
Uh, also, you can tell I haven't prepped for next week yet. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, so today we talked about reinforcement learning and how it's this automated process that could do lots of cool stuff. In many situations, the first thing you want to do is use machine learning or reinforcement learning to augment what a human can do. So think about, I've got a human driven process. Maybe I don't wanna jump all the way to a fully automated process. Maybe I can do something more gradual. And maybe that's because it's easier. But in a lot of cases, you could also say that, find ways that a human and AI team work better than either could on its own. So this, this could be an RL agent, this can be a supervised learning agent, supervised learning model, but there, will, there are cases where the combination of AI and humans are better. And if you can help identify those, then you can find ways to, from either end to make your system much better. And because it's not, because you've got human in the loop and humans are slow, squishy, uh, suboptimal, there are more considerations than data science type people are normally used to, to dealing with. So hopefully we'll, we'll have some time to, to dive into that. And again, if we can make it interactive next week, like we did today, that would be awesome. And think about how these techniques might apply to your kinds of problems. Definitely. Thank you so much, Matt. I really appreciate uh, you spending time with us. Great. Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm.